many texts, articles, and has really uh, ranged the world in his quest for a way of thinking, a set of concepts, an approach that uh, deals with international relations but in a profoundly human way. And I, we were just talking before the, the program, he said he'd been to the Middle East eight times and back since I saw him last, which was last May. And we thought that his perspective would be uniquely suited for tonight, sort of a, a small rehearsal of communication, because he brings together so much the, the deep and profound academic ideas, and also this, um, and you'll wait to hear him speak, but this profound dignity and respect for his own culture and uh, that of other people in the world. Joseph Baker is the director of the Symphony for United Nations, which has produced musical and cultural, uh, I don't know what to, to call them, they're bigger than happenings, but they filled St. Patrick's Cathedral one year, the peace concert, and last year I went to one at the UN, where children from all over uh, came and, and sang for peace with Joe Edgar conducting. They do programs like that. Currently he's working on a video tape, right, I think a full length one, a long one, on the theme of peace in the world based on Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Um, he also is conductor of the Southwest Symphony in Florida, Southwest Florida Symphony. So tonight, several places, and one of her many magnificent photographs is the famous one of, of uh, Einstein with his leather jacket and his wife that is seen in many places. Her name came to me and her image because many years ago she said, why is it those of you who are involved in politics say so little or think so little or write so little about culture and politics, about art and politics, music and politics, photography and politics? I am the heart. This is a friend of mine talking. He said, I am the heart, that means we must learn the alphabet of existence from the beginning and return every morning to practice the exercise. I am the mother of my senses. I feed them from the inside and they are my mothers they feed me from the outside. There is eternity only in motherhood. Through my senses, I become the spirit of eternity. Through me, my senses become the essence of existence. We are one with the one. For me, it has been thus far a journey of 30 years involved in what is described as the academic profession, teaching international relations. On both levels, on a theoretical level, writing about it, 
teaching about it. And on a practical level, participating in processes of change. My limited work and experience has convinced me that what it is for us to work with is not really the area of policy. Oftentimes, we talk about changing policies, introducing a new policy. Participating in deciding about a new policy. I have lived in Washington now over 30 years. On the surface, it appears that policy is the issue. On the surface, it appears that Policy is the issue in terms of hunger, poverty, terrorism, war. On the surface, it appears that equity is the issue. But that is not so. The issue is that it's twofold. It is the issue of who controls technology and who controls belief systems. And the two are interconnected. One of the many reasons why we are not able to affect creative changes in politics is a preoccupation with changing policies without looking closer at belief systems. It is a belief system that accounts and explains why 28 or 29 persons die of hunger every minute. It is a belief system that explains why it is that on one hand, the debt owed by third world nations exceeds the trillion, Yet, on another hand, the volume of arms transfers is about a trillion. It is a belief system. It's a belief system that accounts for the fact that at this time in the Middle East, about two-thirds of all of the arms transfers are being transferred in the Middle East. It's a belief system that accounts for about a million people dead have died since 1980 in the Middle East. About one million. It's a belief system that accounts for the 37 Americans who were killed day before yesterday in the Gulf. What I'm sharing with you and my personal connection with Israel in this area is the notion that politics, we have to begin to look at politics as a cultural activity. That politics is a cultural activity. That international politics is cultural communication in disguise. That every one of us, every person, has and is deeply and unconsciously affected by our culture regarding how we see reality. That there isn't really an objective reality out there. The way I was trained as a student of politics was to believe that there is an objective, empirically verifiable reality out there. And I carried that knowledge with me to my classroom 30 years ago when I started teaching. And I inquired then from my students, 120 magnificent women and men. As the first one, what is the most important issue for you in international politics? And the answer was communism. I said, where are you from? He said, New York. I thanked the person. I said, 
said, you are right, that's true. Then I asked the other person, what is the most important issue in international politics? And the person said, nuclear holocaust. I asked the person where he came from. I said, New Jersey. I said, you are telling the truth. And this kept going on. And kept going on. As asked another student, what is the most important issue for you? He said, refugees. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm a Palestinian. And that's the other person, what's the most important issue for you? And the person said, hunger. And that's the person where he came from. And it turns out he came from West Africa. Then it came to me, whose international politics do you want me to teach you? Because the way I was trained, I was trained to believe that women and men and children die from nuclear weapons and what we ought to be concerned with nuclear, and that's true. But women, men, and children die from hunger and die from poverty and die from many other things, die from belief systems. Belief systems explain many of the things that happen to us. That's how my journey started in looking at culture. How can we begin to connect with culture, culture and politics? How can we deal with that? The power of culture. Because we are all hypnotized, we are all unconsciously affected, but deeply so affected by our culture regarding how we see reality. We are regarding how we analyze politics. A question that comes to me, how can we introduce empathy as a tool in political analysis. That's, that's, a cultural, that's a cultural thing. How can I begin to introduce empathy as a tool of political analysis? Hence, the whole, the whole notion of culture and politics. How do we deal with that? Our culture gives us an epistemology. How do we begin to, how, how we view what is important, because throughout history, the pursuit of peace has been, has been a function of how the dominant culture sees reality. Throughout history, we have pursued peace through the vision through the image of the dominant culture. At this time, the dominant culture is American. The American vision of peace is structural. Nothing wrong with that. It is numerical, it is quantitative, nothing wrong with that. To somewhat, somewhat legalistic. There are many visions throughout history. We have pursued peace through the vision of the dominant culture. We have identified politics with the vision of the dominant culture too. In my university, like many other universities, when we talk and teach about international politics, we are talking and teaching about international politics from the perspective of the dominant culture. A culture that, that is pretty much informed by, by secularization of values, by technification of knowledge, by rationalization of economic activity, and that's how we, that's how not only we as persons living in this culture see it, but this is how others begin to see it. Because the way the dominant culture sees it, sees reality, becomes a reality for others. Specifically talking about the Middle East, the question that comes to me, we who are raised in the Middle East, we are the, we are raised in the land of revelation, yet we cannot seem to see the light upon our own path. I come from the land where the first brother in history killed his first brother, and we have learned so little since the beginning of time. we continue to kill one another. Uh, 
I come from a land, a region, where we are afraid to look at the mirror and recognize our resemblance. We Arabs and Jews. So that's, we are the heirs of an old order of conflict and war. I want us to become the architects of a new order of peace. How do we do it? How, how do we begin to connect with one another? We heard about Baghdad two days ago, the Iraqis, the Iraqi jet fighter killing 37, maybe 40 Americans. I was in Baghdad a few weeks ago. In that same city, I also saw women waiting in line. And when I came to inquire from them what they were waiting in line for, they were waiting in line to purchase powdered milk to feed their infants. And side by side with the mothers waiting in line for powdered milk that was not available, Parading, parading were the most sophisticated high-tech weapons. Yes, I saw that sign. Simultaneously. Yes. So the question becomes, Joe, how can we how can we begin to affect that change? Culture, music, photography. We can connect because once we begin to do that, we, 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 we then move into a different realm of experiencing ourselves as being totally human. And when we do that, we begin to experience loyalty to life through art, through music. We experience loyalty to life. And that harmonizes us. That's how we realize that harmony. Let me conclude with a story. A story that convinces me regards who we are and what we are doing. We can all be doing similar things. It's a story about a person who was visiting a quarry, quarry where they make stones. And the person came to the quarry and looked and saw many people doing identical things. And came to the first person and asked, what are you doing? The person responded, I'm making a living. Was working on the stone kept walking, came to another person and said, what are you doing? And that person was doing the identical thing. He said, dressing stones. He kept walking and came to another person and asked, what are you doing? And the person said, building a cathedral. Now, they were all doing identical things. The first person saw what he was doing in terms of his immediate objective. The second person saw what he was doing, not only in terms of his immediate objective, he was able to transcend the immediate objective, saw what he was doing in terms of the technical problem of dressing stones, the technology involved, the technique. The third person, Dean Morton, Jim Morton, saw what he was doing, he saw the immediate purpose, of making a living. He understood the technology of dressing stones, but he transcended all of that and saw the broader purpose of building the cathedral. Regardless who we are and where we are, we may be teachers, housewives, we may be technicians, we may be waiters, we may be waitresses. It is not where we are and what we are doing, it is how it is that we are experiencing what we are doing. Some of us go through life making billions, but continue to be making a living. 
And you know, you and I know a person like that, the former president of the Philippines, Mr. Marcos. Through till the end, he's still making a living. Yet on the other hand, you and I know women and men who, regardless of what they are doing, they are building cathedrals. I have seen men and women wiping the streets of New York, but they are building cathedrals. Yes. And I have seen waiters in restaurants building cathedrals. Yet I have seen kings and professors just making a living. So what art gives me, art gives me that challenge and music. How do I connect between making a living dressing stones and building the cathedral. Joe, thank you for waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> speak for anybody. I don't speak for Israel. I don't speak for American Jewry, even though I'm an American Jew. I speak only for myself. I only know that in the past dozen years, it's become ever more painful to me to see the destruction that I feel my people are following the self-destruction and the destruction in general, not only by policies, but in the diaspora as well, in countries around the world, the situation among my people. I'm more than an American Jew. I'm really uh, a human being. And so that led me that unbearable feeling of self-destruction of the peoples on this earth, in fact, led me to take certain actions in recent years. And I think I should tell you something about those actions so you know who I am. Most recently, as Liesl mentioned, my organization, the Symphony for United Nations, sponsored a Middle East festival of music and dance, theater, film, visual arts, exhibitions, and a symposium entitled Rehearsals in Communication. Not communication, that's pretty, uh, that's uh, already uh, difficult and uh, can cause people to wonder. But we were simply rehearsing communication. And that's where I first met Abdul Aziz and many other very distinguished people, including a member of the Knesset from Israel, uh, from leaders, world, Arab world leaders, and other distinguished thinkers. We found, I think it was in this very room, we found that we had much more in common, despite whatever differences we had. Prior to that, and any attempt to cover the Middle East in 15, 20 minutes is 
is a total impossibility. The complexities are enormous, as we all know. Prior to that, I had written a number of articles which appeared in Newsweek magazine, New York Times, Christian Science Monitor, and Israeli publications, and elsewhere. I'd like to quote myself from the Newsweek article, which was the first of the series, which appeared in September of 1980. It caused a tremendous reaction. I received hundreds and hundreds of letters and phone calls from all over the world, much hate mail, many encomiums, uh, and it caused a tremendous stir. And what I said on one page was that Menachem Begin reminds me of my father. They looked somewhat alike. My father was long, long dead. But my father looked a bit like Begin. My father was an Orthodox Jew, so Orthodox that when my, the eldest in our family of nine children married a non-Jew, my father, Sat Shiva, performed the rites for the dead. Whereupon, a few years not later, uh, my loving sister obediently died. And she died from what most psychiatrists and psychologists and others say is repressed anger or grief. She died of colitis. And when I was growing up, there were very, very few Jews around, and I was frightened. There were only three Jews in our entire town, three Jewish families, that is. And everybody else was a, a frightening stranger to me, everyone else. And survival was the only uh, question in my family just to get food and housing. And my grandmother judged all issues by one criterion, and I quote her, is it good for the Jews? So we were very ghettoized, even though we lived in, in a small town in Pennsylvania, in, in America. The reaction I felt when my sister came around surreptitiously to visit me while I was playing in the street. And I realized her hurt, a mortal hurt, soon was to be. And I also, even as a small child, I saw for sure the very deep hurt that my father and mother felt about my sister. But that's what they knew. They had never gone to school. And that's what they knew. They were good people. My father was a good man. He was not a murderer. But surely, my sister died because of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy of thinking. In 1951, I moved to Israel to play first French horn in the Israel Philharmonic. And I was deeply moved then to see Jews holding up their heads they were farmers and soldiers instead of uh, people praying and jumping obediently into the ditches so that to save the trouble of the Nazis from pushing them in after they were shot. And they were farmers, and I was proud. I returned to Israel in 1972 to lecture and conduct. A musician in the Haifa Orchestra, which I was then conducting, approached me and said, I'm going to the West Bank for a few days. Would you like to come along? I didn't know what the West Bank was. I said, isn't that dangerous? Aren't there Arabs in the West Bank? <coughs> he said, yes, but uh, I know. I have some friends over there. And he seemed, he convinced me, and I'm of an adventurous spirit, he convinced me that it would probably be okay. 
Since at that time there were no public transportation to the West Bank, we walked to the fields, and for three days we were two Jews, he an Israeli Jew, I an American Jew, surrounded totally by Arabs. And we met Arabs in the coffee houses and the taxis and the buses. And he had a number of friends there, the priest, the minister, uh, other people, doctor, and so on. Uh, and uh, we were met with great kindness. Some of the shopkeepers gave us their favorite foodstuffs and sweets and wouldn't take any money for it, and they learned who we were. Uh, and I felt that there was a tremendous, I was amazed, Arabs that I had been so frightened of. Before I went, I asked some of my friends in Israel whether I should go. They said, you better not. The Arabs may invite you into their tents. I didn't see many tents, by the way. They may invite you into their tents, and they may be gracious, but as you're walking away, something may strike them, and you may find a knife in your back. This was the image that my Israeli friends had of the Arab living a few miles across the land. So I returned with no knife in my back, and very naively and happily began to share with some of my Israeli friends what my experience was. to keep their myths. I learned quickly to keep my mouth closed, but then shortly I returned to the United States and I approached one of my dearest friends, two, a couple musicians also, very prominent musicians, and I began to tell them, surely I could tell my friends of the experience I had. I was in the world of Arabs and I came out got free. More than that, they were human beings. I began to see in my friend's eyes something that I had never seen since we had been friends for many, many years. And I could hear them thinking, what's happened to Edgar? Has he become a traitor? For years I kept my mouth closed after that until 1980 when I wrote this article. Culture is not a string quartet or a Picasso painting. Webster calls it the whole behavior and technology of any people passed on generation to generation, developing intellectual and moral faculties, recognition of aesthetic excellence. It's the whole behavior of a people. What they eat, the music they play, of course, what they look at, how they construct their abodes, how they celebrate weddings or births, how they mourn a death, what their aspirations are. Culture is a behavior, the way of life of a whole people. Another little story. Not too many years ago, I was invited over to Jordan by the Queen of Jordan to be the guest of the royal family for a week. Uh, the arrangements were supposed to be made on this side, and there was some mix-up. But I was told then, get over there and call the Queen's office, and I was given the number, and we'll arrange things and get over there. <coughs> I had come to Israel first to attend the opening sessions of the International Center for Peace and the Middle East. So when the sessions were over, Friday morning, I uh, got in my rented car with a friend, and we drove toward Jerusalem, the 
eventually the drive toward Amman, Jordan. We got to Jerusalem, and I asked directions. I went up to a travel place, directions to get to Amman. You can't go to Amman. They left. We're at war. Um, and uh, so I called up the American embassy. And I said, I'd like to make a phone They said, you can't even make a phone call. So I called up the American embassy, and I said, told them who I was, and said, I'd like to make a phone call. Amma. They said, we can't. There are no telephone lines between uh, Jerusalem and Amma, between Jordan and Israel. So I got into my car, and we drove toward the border. We got near the border and suddenly faced some machine guns pointed at our car. A soldier came up to the window and I told him who I was. I said, I have a, I have a, uh, an appointment with the Queen. He's dropping names, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he said, you can't get, you can't get any further. There's, there's no, you can't get across. And then I, I mentioned the fact that I was a musician that I had conducted and I had played. And it says more, oh, he dropped his gun. Oh, you're a musician. He started to talk to me about his, his voice lessons and so on. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of love for music in Israel. And he said, well, let me call the border guard and see what can be done. I'm sure you can't get past them. So he called, and sure enough, we went to the border guards who were even more difficult. They said, you can't get across there. And they were also uh, very nice because by this time they knew that I was a musician. <laughs> and uh, uh, we uh, finally persuaded him. He says, you'll be back, I'm sure. And, uh, but there's no place to keep your car. So anyway, there were a lot of details that had to be taken care of. And they said the Sabbath was coming on. Well, we finally got on the on a little bus that crosses the Jordan River, which is more like a little stream, if that. Mm -hmm. And uh, here there was a uh, Jordan soldier with also guns trained on the two of us. We got to the border. We had, where on the Israeli side there was a huge military installation. We got on the Jordanian side there was a little hut. We got into a hut with the guns trained on it. No English. No French, no German, my, the only language that I can communicate at all in. And uh, I tried to communicate something about the Queen and uh, very suspicious looks. And like, one of the soldiers went off to communicate probably through a walkie-talkie or whatever to find out what's going on with these two strange Americans, apparently. We were waiting and waiting, and the soldier turned on his little radio. And on the radio was some music that we both recognized, my friend and I. My friend and I looked at me and said, it sounds like Feirouz. Feirouz is a singer, a Lebanese singer, who was probably the most popular person <laughs> in the Middle East. Uh, and I had uh, uh, worked with her, and I had presented her in Carnegie Hall, and here at uh, the United Nations, at the Kennedy Center. Um, and uh, so I knew her, and I knew her music. As soon as the soldier heard uh, my friend say, Beirut, I said, yes, that's Beirut. He said, you know Beirut? <laughs> or you like Beirut? That it was you like Beirut, not you know. There was no indication of knowing. And I said, yes. The gun went on the table. <laughs> And then they tried their mightiest to uh, make our trip very, very possible. And uh, I won't tell you the rest of the story, but my point is that the mere fact of recognizing, just recognizing the music, their music, suddenly made us brothers and sisters. The same in Israel, the same in Jordan the power of culture in international relations. I'd like to say a word or two about the situation today. I grieve daily 
because of the enemy that my people are making throughout the world. We have been depending on the God, on the military God, to give us security, to protect us. And our security is less today, I would venture, our, when I speak of our, uh, and I, I, parenthetically, I should indicate uh, my right to say our. I never used to, because uh, as an American Jew, I'm not an Israeli. But in yesterday's paper in the New York Times, there was a big paid ad which says, be brave, Mr. Perez, give up. And some of you may have seen that, but what it says in essence, it, it, it's paid for by uh, Slate 6, the Herut Zionists, the Herut Party is the party of Shamir, uh, Sephardic Movement Coalition, uniting the Jewish people for a united land of Israel. And these are Americans, most of them, and they have taken this ad in the New York Times uh, for Israel. So I think it's about time that American Jews speak up as Israeli Jews are speaking up about Israeli official policy. I think it's time that we support that, that portion of Israel that wants peace, which is over 50% by uh, actual count in recent years, and that uh, we let our voices be heard. I brought along many quotations from the Israeli press, which uh, question, strongly question, the holding of territories, of treatment of the Arab populations in Israel and in the territories. Um, so in Israel, there's much, much questioning as there has been over the years, but in this country, we American Jews, through guilt perhaps, through wanting to keep, wanting to pre protect our little beachhead of a country, for all good reasons perhaps, we have kept our mouths closed. It's, it's, not, it's changing now. There are half a dozen organizations in America, Jewish organizations, which care about Israel, as do I, who are questioning some of the policies that have been practiced and who are now supporting the attempts toward, uh, toward uh, dialogue and toward negotiation and toward finding some just peace. I agree with my brother, Abdul Aziz, about the spirit being just as important as the reality. But I would put it that the reality is just as important as the spirit. And we have to address, uh, if you speak about the, sp the spirit to some of the people in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the jails, in the Palestinian people who have been uh, uh, summarily kicked out of their homes, not only in, in 1947, but in recent years. Uh, they will want their homes back that they've, they've, they've had for centuries. And if we can respect other cultures, other peoples, we have the beginnings of finding a way for security and a peaceful world for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Just to permit me a comment, we both have launched together a movement, and we welcome you to join the movement. We call it Imagination Liberation Movement. Imagination Liberation Movement. Everyone is invited. What you are saying, what we need here in the United States is a constituency on behalf of peace in the Middle East, not constituencies on behalf of advocacies of particular policies. And this applies to both 
Americans who are of the Jewish faith or Americans who are of Arab descent. Because we both have found ourselves practicing advocacy situations, but not a peace constituency. We need a constituency on behalf of peace in the Middle East. What we need now in the United States are Arabs, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, and others to go to Washington and begin hearings on limiting and banning the transfer of conventional weapons to the region in the minds from America, from Britain, from France, from Russia, from Switzerland. This is what we need. We need simultaneous with the nuclear freeze movement, we need a movement to stop the transfer of weapons. From Israel. From Israel, from all over. They have, we have to stop that. We have to stop practicing the role of a cheering squad. That's what we are doing. And every time we are cheering, Children, men and women are dying in the Middle East. Our brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask you to, to go along with the scenario that I put out before. It's a tight one, though, because Professor Saeed has a plane to catch at 9.30, so he's going to have to leave at 20 up in 15 minutes. Let me ask a question. Right. Wait. Well, perhaps we're going to have to change the uh, No. Take a few questions now. Yeah. Yes. We'll take questions now, not statements, but questions. May I? Yeah. Yes. There once was an organization called Committee on Jewish Arab Cooperation. Does it still exist, or what happened to it? Can everyone hear the question? There once was an organization on Jewish, Jewish Arab, Arab Cooperation. What has happened to it that organization? Does it still exist? Uh, in Israel. I, I think I think I've heard of it, and I think they are still functioning. There are now uh, uh, dozens of organizations in Israel, and now growing in America for uh, to improve understanding. The situation, the situation has changed from when I first wrote this article in 1980. It's changed radically, but not sufficiently. Sir. Yes, I have a question. achieved 
security today. Are we going to be any more secure when we have these wonderful technological military uh, 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 weapons? Meanwhile, I think we know, that we, uh, I think we're learning, I hope, that we cannot depend upon America forever. America, in fact, is shipping arms to the Arabs, just as they are shipping arms, and they're shipping arms to Iran, just the way they're shipping the shipped arms to Israel, and Reagan is not the Jews' friend. And nor are we have to look for our friends throughout the world, and the only security I submit will be the security of, of if it's not too late, of undoing the, the, uh, the being the pariah of the world. We had uh, an enormous reservoir of goodwill when Israel was first born. Sure, we needed an army, but now we have dissipated a great deal of that goodwill, and I think that uh, we have to begin, I think a con even if this international conference is held, that Perez is trying to achieve, and even if we do talk to the PLO, which I, which I strongly advocate, uh, that will not be sufficient. We have to change our attitude. We have to change our cultural approach. We have to, we have to approach these people with respect. They are other human beings. And we have to learn, we have to learn that, that the strength of the Jewish people over 2,000 years has been our ethics and our morality and the teachings that we have, that we have had. And that when, once we renounce those teachings, as many of our people are today, then we lose our strength just as Samson lost his strength by cutting his hair, I think we lose our strength by cutting our, our ethics. Okay. We have to make friends. Okay. I, I, uh, just like just a very brief comment. Uh, your statement is accurate. It reflects my experience uh, in the Middle East at this time. People's awareness for peace has advanced far more rapidly than the position of the government. This is I have been to Jerusalem as well as to Arab states. And as I heard you talk and I heard you make a presentation, it's also quite correct in saying that militarism has not preserved, has not guaranteed security, because ultimately what we see violence breeds more violence on both sides. But what really came to me as we were talking, for me, a very liberating personal experience. For me, a process of dehypnotization that has liberated me was the awareness that while it is said that you and I are created in the image of the divine, we have created our enemy in our own image. And for me, the most liberating experience as a person has been to discover that the you is my brother and my sister, that he and she are not my enemy. And as I was connecting with Joe, making the statements made by Joe, uh, it, it underscored that feeling, I started seeing it again, that that was, for me, a dehypnotization, becoming dehypnotized to that realization that, that we are one. Thank you. Given the, the short time we have, I'd like to also ask that you direct questions to cultural power and international relations, and not only to the Middle East. So someone coming from that perspective, you, yes. And then okay, what do you mean by belief systems and what belief systems are opposing to keep the situation in conflict? I'm referring to belief systems on both levels. Uh, belief system on one level that I'm using it describes the way every person is affected by his and her culture to see, to believe, and see reality. That's one level of belief system. Mm -hmm. And that breeds many other things. Breeds materialism, spirituality, gain, loss. For me, what I see in international politics at this time, a change in focus from a horizontal to a vertical situation. A change in focus from right versus left to, to values versus values, ecological values, family values, spiritual values, material values, and they manifest themselves in different forms. So when I refer to belief systems, I'm 
referring to the way we see reality. Because what we see determines what we believe about it. And that manifests itself in many things. If you want to talk about Islam, sure, Islam is a belief system. Islam as a belief system is marginalized by those who look at Islam. Because Islam as a belief system continues to be viewed as a revisionist belief system, which it is, because Islam emanated from a Jewish Christian context. It began as a revisionist belief system. It continues to be regarded as a revisionist belief system. What happens, the Muslim goes on the defensive, and the, the rest of the world looking at the Muslim marginalizes the Muslim. That's all the belief system. Marginalization of revisionism. But I have in mind belief systems on many, many levels. When I say belief system, meaning a belief system that determines what we see as reality. I remember in 1970, for example, there was a dominant belief system that the issue number one in diplomacy was narcotics and drugs. And President Nixon had many conferences about that. And the Congress of the United States was uh, adopted much legislation. That was a belief system. How do we see reality? Uh, I'd just like to point out that the woman who asked that question is Dr. Rachel Lauer, who's uh, one of the leading thinkers uh, many people believe in the United States, perhaps in the world. She's the head of the, uh, the Center for, uh, for Thinking at the Face University. And I remember when she first took that post, there were a number of universities, including Harvard, that were, that were all vying for her. At <laughs> the commercial, she pays me off. <laughs> Not a cheering squad, but a commercial. <laughs> yes, you were next. Uh, Would you stand, perhaps? Right, if you will set study. Uh, you've been talking about an imagination liberation movement. I was wondering if in any way that, that would be, as a base, using the professionals that go doctors who have international areas, too far, they seem to be going toward most of the Western areas. Is it possible within the uh, liberation movement that you're talking about and the imagination to have them move into other areas in the Mideast? Yeah, of course, and this is, again, going back to the question, uh, how do we do that? That's, as someone raised in that region, for a long time, I kept struggling with, with, in my own experience, because I was raised with an intuitive consciousness, then I was educated formally into a rational linear consciousness. Uh, and that was a real struggle for me. That's, that's also me. I was led to believe, in, through my formal education, that the road to truth was, was paved with, with patterns of Hellenic rationalism and Hebraic messianism and forget everything else. That's, that was my education, and I lived with that for a very long time. Now I know that, yes, it is true that the road to truth contains patterns from Hellenic rationalism, Hebraic messianism, but Islam, Buddhism, Shintoism, atheism. Now, the same guys that you are talking about, men and women, what happens with them, they feel this power, this sense of powerlessness. What I see in them is, is a sense of powerlessness in terms of dealing with their own issues in terms of accepting responsibility uh, and as they don't want to go there. Uh, they, they, even when they go to Syria, they stay in Damascus. They are talking about medical doctors, doctors, physicians, well, yeah. But there is, I mean, my suggestion to, to my Arab brothers and sisters, what they ought to be reading now, is not Lenin or Jefferson or the new books on economics or politics, but they, they ought to begin to read uh, writings on women liberation movement and see how the women liberation movement has to do with the whole issue of powerlessness of, and re-empowerment because there's a tremendous amount of disempowerment in the Middle East and that's a belief system. A belief because a greater thing about our beliefs not what we believe but our beliefs about our beliefs that we can't change them. And they really believe that they have really come to believe as I believe for a long time of, of a, a deep seated sense of helplessness, hopelessness the only neutrality would be that oh. this is the human body. That's right. That's right. That's right. I have to ask not to have a cross talk. Don Johnson. Yeah, I want to ask, uh, I send a brief, I think what you're saying about cultural power is important. Although I must say, 
Sunday, I saw two articles that countered that in terms of the experience we've heard in this country in relationship with whites and blacks. That is, we talked about here, there are some areas where the cultural way is where the real growth in terms of understanding has happened. Yet there was two articles in the Times Sunday, one that showed the kind of positions blacks have been allowed to play in baseball, generally outfield, and also the limitation of blacks in terms of never seeming to make it into the management kinds of positions. The other article was about the recording industry in the arts and leisure section, showing that blacks sometimes manage to make it in terms of music, but in terms of quite often this crossover, that you have to be able to cross over from one racial group, that songs um, composed by blacks are considered to be only crossovers when a white uh, musician takes over. So although I think what you're saying is an important kind of concept, the two questions I have are, one, how do we get beyond the kind of su superficial assumption that once that starts, like baseball and music, um, how do we make sure it becomes a reality and not simply a surface thing that isn't deep? And secondly, how are the ways that we get the kind of cultural power in international politics to be a, uh, a process that we use in a place like ethical culture and in New York City and other ways to a larger extent than we're doing now? I'd like to hear from both of you. Well, I may respond to that. It's for me, it's a, it's a question that I'm trying to deal with in my own work, developing a peace studies program in my university. How do we deal with that? Uh, really, since when, when I think of beliefs, uh, we, we even choose unconsciously. I mean, from what I'm connecting, I'm talking with friends of mine in neurosciences, uh, neurology, and, and psycho-spirituality and some of the recent findings, we, we even choose unconsciously. And in responding to your question, I don't know what to say at this time other than I am looking at that area as one person. I'm not willing anymore to accept that there is, that it's an area that has been resolved. For me, creativity is the result of the complementary functioning of the intuitive and the rational. It's not one or the other. And I have, it is taking me a great deal of time personally to deal with that. Because my whole formal education has conditioned me one way. My background has conditioned me a different way. And that is really very, very hard. I experienced myself marginalized, but the reason I accept that now because I went through mainstream thinking. So to respond to you through education, I think it is it is both task and experience. Responding to your question. It's both task and it's, the task part of it is is confronting objective realities conditions. The experience is awareness and the evolution of words. Forgive me, I have to go because I Otherwise, I will miss the last shuttle to Washington. Thank you very much for inviting me.